activate. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Getting ahead of myself because I want you to see this whole deal about looking for witnesses. In Mark chapter 14, verses 55, 56, Mark saw this. Now the chief, not he didn't see it, but this was reported to him. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. Now, this, what they were doing, looking for witnesses and everything, it may, not have been, it may not have been illegal. It may have been legal to go look for witnesses, but it was a highly unusual court procedure, especially for a religious court. It was a highly unusual court procedure to attempt to find anything that would make Jesus worthy of death. Because while many false witnesses volunteered, none of them had, could agree on anything about Jesus. So right away, their whole basis for their case was falling apart. So they had nothing. So they had to go look for witnesses, somebody who could come up and testify against Jesus. Now, the fact that all of these witnesses that they were finding couldn't agree, they couldn't come up with any kind of legitimate witness, any, any legitimate testimony against Jesus, uh, should have been a, a red flag for them. It should have alerted them. Uh, that it was that uh, they had a problem and that in itself now listen to what I'm saying that in itself that there were no fault the, the, these witnesses could not agree on anything meaning that apparently there were false witnesses that in itself was a harsh breach of their own law if you go back to Deuteronomy I want you I'm just going to read this law from Deuteronomy remember the Sanhedrin they were they were Sadducees and they believed this was the law this is what you abide by this is the law of Moses and so this is what Deuteronomy 19 starting with verse 15 says a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that has that he has committed only on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses shall a charge be established if a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall, re shall inquire diligently, and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. You shall purge the evil from your midst." So their own law said that when these witnesses came forward and couldn't agree on anything, the fact that they were looking to, to put Jesus to death meant that they should have put those false witnesses to death. But they ignored that law. Finally, they, led, they, they find two witnesses who agreed that Jesus had once said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. <laughs> well, we got something now. Jesus had said that approximately three years earlier. And it was at the, at the onset of his ministry. And it was, he was not referring to the temple itself. He was referring to himself. It's in John chapter 2, verse 15 through 19. And making a whip of cords. This is when he went in to drive these out. This is why these guys remembered it, because they were there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Man, have you ever wanted to do that in a store? <laughs> and he told those who sold, I mean, I'm not suggesting that you do that. I'm just saying <laughs> sometimes when you go into stores and they're just so obnoxious, and, never mind. And he, to, and he told those who sold the, by the way, I was in a store one time, and this is why you never get behind me in a when I'm at a cash register. And the cash register jammed. The cash register jammed because I'm sitting there because I'm, 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 I'm the next guy up, right? So I'm sitting there going, oh, man, you know. And, of course, here come, they've got a problem. They're working and working on working. Now the line's 13 deep, 13 people deep, you know, at least. And so they, oh, we got a problem, we got a problem. So somebody says, they call for somebody to come help and so forth and so on. I need somebody. And... Uh, somebody comes up to take another cash register, and they'll say, um, they should have said, I'll take the next person. Right? No. Uh, line seven is open. Poosh, you all take, and I'm, you know, I'm stuck. <laughs> At that point, I would have really liked to take a whip of cords and drive them all out of the store. Anyway. 
But this was different. Jesus was doing this because he, they, were, they, were, they were really sacrilegious. They were, they were doing this in the temple. And the law was very clear that it wasn't, the temple could not be used for that sort of thing. They were violating their own law. And Jesus went in and cleaned it out. And he said, do, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His, remember, he also said that it, it was a house of prayer, which is what the Old Testament taught. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So that's, what, that's when Jesus said that. He was saying, destroy me, and in three days I'll rise again. Now, he, so he has two witnesses that said this, because that, that, they were there, and they remembered what he said. And the high priest attempted to get Jesus to respond to those accusations that were brought against him. Still, Jesus remained intentionally silent. He had a reason for that. The reason was he needed the high priest to put him under oath. So there was no point in saying anything until he was under oath, because once he was under oath, then what he said was validated that he was under oath, basically. And so, he was, and so that's exactly what the high priest did. Once the high priest charged Jesus under an oath by the living God, Jesus had to answer, and he, you know, it was considered that whatever he answered was his answer, and would be, he would be held bound to that answer. So that's why he was remaining silent. Plus, it also fulfilled scripture. It also fulfilled prophecy. But the reason for that was that he, would, he, would, uh, he had to be under oath so that what he said would be credited as exactly what he said and therefore charged with that. Essentially, Jesus forced them to put him under oath so that everyone would know that what he was speaking was what he, what he believed was truth and what he knew was truth. Caiaphas insisted that Jesus answer whether or not he was the Christ, which is, means the Messiah, the chosen one the Son of God. And Jesus answered in the affirmative. He said, you said it. And not only a simple yes, but he added that in the future he would sit on the right hand of the Father and he would return on the clouds of heaven. I love, Matthew 26, 54 says it this way. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on clouds of heaven. And Caiaphas went nuts. It was a clear statement by Jesus of his deity. That's what Jesus was saying. What Jesus was saying to Caiaphas, I am the Christ, I am the Son of God, I am deity, I am God. And so it was, it was, it was so enraging to Caiaphas that Caiaphas immediately tore his clothes. Remember that in the passage? He immediately ripped his clothes uh, and the problem with that is that the high priest is forbidden to do that. Go back to the law of Moses, the law that the Sadducees followed, and look at Leviticus 21.10. The priest who is chief among his brothers, on whose head the anointing oil is poured, and who has been consecrated to wear the garments, shall not let the hair of his head hang loose, nor tear his clothes. And so... He violated the law again, second time. And hypocritically, Caiaphas declared that Jesus had spoken blasphemy, even though he had just violated the religious law. Caiaphas, you see, was in a spot. He and the people had only two choices after Jesus said that. They only had two choices. One was to acknowledge that Jesus was speaking the truth and fall down and worship him as the Messiah, or the other was to reject him as a blasphemer and put him to death. They chose the latter, and that sealed their rejection of the one who came as their Messiah King, and they rejected him and put him to death. But also by accusing Jesus, by the way, of blasphemy, there was no need of a witness. So they had this problem of witnesses that were just iffy. I mean, why the Roman government was not going to put Jesus to death because he said, hey, you know, you destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. They were not going to put him to death for, the, you know, for saying that just because, you know, just, he's, you know, he, I can't believe he said that. And yeah, he said that. But if it was considered blasphemy, 
then they could put him to death. And Caiaphas declares it as blasphemy because he, as the high priest, had the authority to declare what was blasphemous. They didn't have to vote on blasphemy. The high priest had the authority to say, that is blasphemous. And as soon as he said, that is blasphemous, they didn't need any witnesses. They had their case. No further evidence was examined. Didn't need it. The high priest had spoken, and he said, how do you rule? He told the Sanhedrin, okay, this is blasphemy. What are you going to do about it? And they said, put him to death. No one defended Jesus. No one was even asked to defend Jesus. No one pointed to the works that he had performed among them during his past three years. It appeared that the Sanhedrin had Jesus right where they wanted him. He had just spoken words of blasphemy, which they all heard. And then, contrary to all Jewish and all Roman law, they took it upon themselves to punish Jesus. Matthew 26, verses 67 to 68. They spit in his face, they struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? They began punishing him before he even was taken to the Roman court. You talk about guilty before you even have a trial. They broke Jewish law and they broke Roman law by doing that. And uh, the Lord remained silent through this entire terrible ordeal, submitting himself to his Father's will. And that fulfilled another prophecy, which is in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. And that's how the second religious trial concluded against Jesus. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.